Palm Sunday is this moment that we had in the procession, and then quickly the week moves to other places, to other events, to other happenings, and finally, ultimately, it moves to the cross, and that is where we have gone today, to the cross, to the cross of Jesus Christ. I was looking this week and watching again a reproduction, a play of, of the, or presentation of the last hours of Jesus' life from the Gospel of John. We used that this morning, that video from the Gospel of John in the early service to remind us of those events on the cross, of these last words of Jesus on the cross. And I want to tell you that it bothers me as I look at the church today in our world. We forget... We forget that Jesus died not just so we could be saved, but so that the world might be saved. And once we come to Christ and come to know Him as a people of God, we become part of the body of people who are responsible for taking the gospel into the world. How many of us realize that there are people who don't know the gospel story? And we, we hear about them, don't we? They live in other lands, don't they? Not so. I can tell you that some many years ago, back in the 1980s, when I was in brand new at the United Methodist Hour and just beginning a ministry there, I was invited to do a, a ministry in a certain camp. And I was invited because I was a headliner often at Youth Week at Lake Junaluska, and they thought, well, maybe if Sam Morris comes... We'll have a lot of people come. Didn't, didn't work. <laughs> we, had, we had some empty places in the camp, and so they asked me if I minded if they invited the children who lived in the housing projects, the teenagers, to come. And I said, absolutely not. Please ask them to come. And so they came on that, sun, on that week for the week of camp at our, as our guest, and they participated every day. It was their first event at a Christian camp. And being naive of people who perhaps didn't know the gospel as we in the church know it, I began to talk and do the same things that I had done many times in many church camps that I'd been part of. We had no more than 100 young people total there, so I thought we'll play the name game and get to know everybody the first night. And the name game starts in a big circle, and you're okay if you're the first, second, third, fifth, or tenth person because all you have to do is remember all the names that are before you. Just, that's it. But if you're the last person, you have to remember all the names. And, and I liked playing that game. I was, thought I was pretty good at it, so I put myself in the last seat. Twenty names in, I knew I was dead meat. It was all over. I'd never heard some of the names that were being given to me from these children who didn't grow up with the traditions we did. If you want to know what my children's names are, Abe, Ike, Sam, Sam's a family name. The others are biblical names. In fact, they're all biblical names, Samuel, Abraham, Isaac, and even Jonathan's name is a biblical name. Most of our names come from familiar places. We know those names, but these were names I'd not heard of before. None of them came out of the Bible, and some of them didn't, were, were combinations of words. So I finally decided it would be best to take high ground and abandon that game pretty quickly, and we did. It was a great week, but talking about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, talking about Jesus even, was difficult in this setting because it suddenly dawned on me that these young people did not know those stories. They had never heard them. And even the name Jesus, though they were familiar with it, the name Jesus simply was a word that they most often heard in profanity and not in telling the story. Now, we know there are people in the world who don't know the Christian story. I was in another place where a young woman came up to the front to check out and to see if I had been telling the truth about a particular item that was at the front of the church after the service because it was the first time she had heard the story of Christ. She didn't know the story. We may love to tell the story, but unfortunately we don't tell it wide enough because guess where those two events were? One, the first one was in Waveland, Mississippi. Not Kansas, not California, not New York. Not anywhere else, but in Mississippi. 
in Waveland, Mississippi. They didn't know the stories of the Scripture that we take for granted. In fact, it bothers me that sometimes the church is so used to hearing the story of Christ that we're not moved at all by it. We just hear it, and oh my goodness, wasn't that nice? And we go out without doing anything about it. God doesn't call us to come to Him so that we can have our sins forgiven and have our place in heaven assured. That's not the reason. That's a byproduct. That's a serendipity of salvation. If you are saved, if you know Christ, if you come to believe in Jesus, if you trust your life to Jesus, you get heaven. You get a place where God takes care of you for the rest of eternity. But that's a byproduct. What you get first is a place in the church, and you get to join with God in doing the work of Christ in the world. We, we've got the attitude today, and, and I see it in so many places, that we want to be entertained. We Christians want to be entertained. If it feels good, we want to go. If it's going to be fun, we want to go. I, that's nothing new. I saw it with teenagers all the years I was working with teenagers, but it bothers me seeing it with adults. I had a way of dealing with it with teenagers. We used to take teenagers in places where it was difficult, backpacking in the Tetons or in the Rocky Mountain National Park. And one of the reasons we did is because about the third day in the backcountry, whether you wanted to or not, whether your feet were blistered or not, whether your muscles ached or not, you had one choice, and that was to put one foot in front of the other or go because you couldn't sit down or risk getting eaten, eaten by the bears. Yeah, how about that? Do you know life is like that? It is, isn't it? We know life is like that. We see the suffering and the difficulties in life, but why don't we equate it with our work in the church? Why are Christians today have their feelings on their sleeves so often that the least little thing can get us off track and give us an excuse not to go out there in the rough and tumble of telling the story of Jesus in this world? God wants you and me to get in there and mix it up. Let me tell you, Jesus came into the world to make things right. But making things right doesn't mean fixing the mess that we're in. Because 2,000 years later, the world is still in a mess, isn't it? Isn't it? Don't we still have sickness? Don't we still have death? Don't we still have wars and rumors of wars? Don't we still have tragedy? Aren't all those things still here? So what did Jesus do for us? He gave us the right path so that we could navigate through all of this mess and get through it, but not alone. Not alone. God wants us to be bearers of the good news, and being bearers of the good news means we invite others. I, I think that we've got it backwards today. We sometimes want to go to church and feel better so that we can kind of stick with it a little bit during the week, you know. Sometimes we say, well, I wish we had that midweek service because I need that, quote, pick me up during the midweek. Hmm. How, how, how do you feel about that? What do you think about that? Is that the way we do? Do we want to go to praise and worship so that we can praise God and it makes us feel good? What, what is it that makes us be good? How much more powerful our praise would be if we came to church filled with an overflowing of what we have seen in God's work in the world? You know what the angels in heaven rejoice about? Do you know what the angels in heaven rejoice about? Jesus said, there's more joy in heaven over one sinner that repents than over 99 church services where nobody does. Oh, excuse me, I don't think that's exactly right, but it's close, isn't it? <laughs> There's more joy in heaven over one sinner that repents than over 99 services where everybody praises the Lord and doesn't do anything about it. <laughs> How can we look at Jesus? And not know that it cost something. How can we hear about the seven last words of our Lord and not know that the gospel is not cheap? That grace was not cheap? 
that it cost the life of our Lord. That Jesus suffered and died to show us the way. To show us how to navigate a path through this life of suffering and sorrows. We are people who live in denial. We Americans are especially good at denial. We like to brag that we've never had a war fought really on our shores since the Civil War. Hmm. Is that something to brag about? Or is that something to be humble and grateful and to know that that may not be true always? And suffering may come to us one day. There's nowhere in the Scripture that says, I promise you, your life will be good if you will just believe in me. I promise you, it will all work out if you will just trust in me. No, I promise you that no matter what happens, I will be with you, Jesus said. No matter what you must face, no matter what you must go through, no matter how difficult life is, I will be there with you if you trust me. This is the Gospel. This is the good news. And guess what? You don't experience the power of God when everything is going right from a human standpoint. You don't experience the power of the resurrection of the Holy Spirit because you don't need it when everything's going just fine from a human standpoint. And my friend who wrote the book, The Becomers, said in in that book, he's a professor today at Asbury Seminary, he said in that book many years ago, God does not and will not equip freight trains to pull little red wagons. God will not equip freight trains to pull little red wagons. And if you want a little red wagon put in religion, You're going to have enough faith to pull that little red wagon because God is not going to equip you to pull a freight train if all you want to do is have enough religion to make you feel a little better someday. God wants you to have enough religion that you hurt over the suffering of the world. I I said this last week, but I believe it's true. That if we want a faith where we never feel bad, don't be a Christian. Don't trust in Jesus because you're going to see things and know things and experience things that you don't want to know about and you don't want to see and you don't want to experience. You're going to find out that you're going to see some of the hurts in others that you can't pass by. I've seen it. I've seen people go into places and do things that they would never have done if it had not been for the power of God working in their lives and leading them. God doesn't equip freight trains to pull little red wagons. And God doesn't equip battleships, He said, to sail around in mud puddles. If we want to see the power of God released in the world, a power that was released on the cross that could raise Jesus from the dead, a power that could transcend that awful event and take us beyond it and have us still talking about it 2,000 years later, a power that would send His disciples out into the world not to have a praise and worship service every week, but to praise and worship in the midst of their suffering and their sorrow and many of them to die for the sake of Christ. If we want that kind of power released in our world, a power that can make right what is wrong, a power that can show the right way in the midst of the darkness of life, a power that can take us beyond where we are. And we must be willing to step into the light of Christ's suffering and death so that we may experience His resurrection. Jesus said it. If you then are crucified with me, you will be resurrected with me. He didn't say, if you feel good with me. You know, he enjoyed life. He laughed and ate with his followers. But there comes a moment when we must go deeper. When we must want more. When it's no longer about us. 
Do you hear that? Is this about Jesus? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Is that about Jesus? No. It's about those who were killing him. To the thief on the cross who said, this man doesn't deserve it. I deserve it. This day you will be with me in paradise. Is that about Jesus? No, it's about the thief on the cross. When he looks down and sees his mother and knows that the only one to take care of her is him, the eldest son, and he's dying. And he says, woman, behold your son. And looks at John. And to John he says, behold your mother. Is he thinking about himself? My God. My God. Why have you forsaken me? And even then, is that about himself? Or the emptiness that he has chosen to experience for the world that he died to save? Ah, but I thirst. What is there to drink? Humiliation, that's what he will get. Gall. Vinegar. Even that to fulfill the Scripture, the promise, so that we would know that God had planned to show His love even in such a painful, dramatic way. It is finished. What is finished? The work that He came to do. And the high priest holds up the Lamb at the end of the Passover and shouts, when the last Lamb dies, the high priest says, It is finished! And Jesus cries with a loud voice on the cross, it is finished. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And again, what does he do? I show them the way. <laughs> Let not your heart be troubled, he said to his disciples. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. And if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? that where I am, there you may be also, and if I go, I will come again. Even that is not about Him. It is about us. And it is about the world that Christ died to save. This is the Passion Week of our Lord. Are we passionate about what He is passionate about? Are we passionate about what Jesus wanted? Are we passionate to see the world saved? Or am I just content to be okay myself? May God have mercy on us, on His church, the body of Christ in the world. When we lose sight of why He came and why He saved us, and set us apart as a royal priesthood. In the words of the Apostle Peter, a royal priesthood that we might be the priest for the world to bring God, to bring Christ to the world. This is Holy Week. This is the passion of Christ. May we walk it with Him until His desire becomes I desire, our, our desire. And the mind, as Paul said, let this mind that is in Christ Jesus be in you. What love? What willingness to see beyond Himself? We are His people church.